Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar tech talk session of today. Topic of today is wireless basics application and recommendation by recommended sure solution. Uh, as you can see, we are back in office. Uh, we are not working from home now. So the setup what we have is slightly different than what you have seen in our previous webinars. And uh, this webinar is going to be slightly different than uh, what you guys have seen before. Uh, we are going to keep this webinar uh, basically a kind of tech talk kind of session where we have invited uh, uh, one of the guests who is joining our gang. Actually, he is not a uh, he is a part of our gang, but he is joining us to make this session even more interactive. Um, so uh, today we will not only talk about the the presentation. We will be having an interactive Q and A session. So let me introduce the team. As you guys are already knowing, um, Ritendra, of course me, Anish and I, we both uh, are the part of systems application team. We will be your host. And uh, we are having a guest here, Andrea Granata. Uh, he is a market development, development manager uh, of Pro Vertical Insure Middle East and Africa. Uh, he is uh, quite new in industry. Um, uh, just having 18 plus years of experience and uh, he, he knows a little bit about RF, uh, but still we say him like RF guru. So he is going to be discussing a lot about wireless system and uh, uh, clarify all your doubts. Um, talking Hello. about. Us. Yeah. Hello and thank you for the introduction. Welcome everyone. Pleasure Andrea. Yeah. So let's talk about a little. Uh, on the housekeeping and ground rule side. Uh, as you guys are already aware that webinar is on BlueChain's platform. Uh, if you guys are having issues in terms of bandwidth, so we recommend to select the low bandwidth mode uh, to avoid any kind of interruption. But uh, if in case you can't, you have the bandwidth issue is still, don't worry, we are gonna record this session and we will share the recording uh, with you guys once the, the webinar, this tech talk session is done. Yeah. Participants video and microphones are muted. It's one way. So if you guys are having any question, you feel like you want to ask this, you're having that or these doubts, feel free to type in Q&A box and we will answer at the end of the session. Yeah, this slide is also explaining uh, how exactly the view of your uh, window. Uh, on, on your left hand side, you can see uh, there is a button for full screen. You just click there and the, the webinar is gonna convert in full screen. Uh, if you want to see the presenter and the presentation together, you can use this slider. On your right hand side is having Q&A uh, button. That's the button number six. So you click on that and type your questions. Yeah, so without further ado, let's talk about this topic, what we have today, wireless basics. So first question usually come in, in our mind is, why wireless? Why do we need that? We have a nice uh, ceiling array microphone, table array microphone, wired microphone, which is doing great job. So why do we need wireless system? Yeah, so let's talk about this. The first thing is flexibility. As you know that nowadays the trend is to have the modular room. Uh, you will be having your table and chairs with, uh, with the wheels on it. And you may use the room, uh, for example, one day like a training room, second day like a boardroom or conference room. So you don't want to run the cable every now and then, and you don't want a kind of fixed installation for those kind of modular type of the room. So the first benefit of wireless system is to have no cables. You don't have any cable, easy and flexible setup, of course. Uh, you just need to take the microphone from your credenza or from the network charging station. And uh, yeah, so, Okay, one second, guys. I think I need to share my screen. Okay, so, yeah, so easy and flexible setup, and uh, it offers mobility. So whenever you need, you just take the microphone and just move all across the room, and it is gonna take care of uh, uh, of your microphone need. You, you're not only just, uh, having a specific area from where you can just go and then speak. You It offers the mobility. And it works pretty well for multi-purpose and combinable rooms. Uh, you have a different types of seating layout. You just 
just undock the microphone from the charging station and then put it in front of you, use it, and once that is done, put it back to the charging station. So that kind of flexibility usually you get with the wireless. Now, other benefit what it can offer is cost saving. Consider a boardroom, and we are pretty much aware about that. Uh, the boardroom is having the most expensive thing in the boardroom is the table. And when you go in front of interior designer and say like, you know, I have a microphone solution uh, which needs to be placed here and I want to have 10 holes. So they freak out basically. They don't want to have any kind of touch or any kind of uh, uh, holes on table. So it becomes quite difficult to convince them. So having a wireless system, no hole, no drilling on furniture, it saves your life, uh, people are happy and it offers those kind of flexibility. No infrastructure, cabling setup, any kind of limitation with that. Yeah. Now, other benefit, what I can say is infrastructure limitation. Consider you are uh, working on a uh, working for a mosque, old mosque, old ancient building, and you need to have the microphone solution there. Yeah. And having wired and having drill, it's quite uh, impossible uh, to have there. So having a wireless system helps a lot because you'll be having the receiver installed somewhere and your microphone can connect with that. It offers clean, uncluttered look. Yeah, so these all are the benefits what we can say in terms of a wireless system. Yeah, now I'm gonna ask a couple of questions to Andrea. So Andrea is gonna join me. So yeah, Andrea, my first question for you is, uh, what are, are the components for the wireless system? So hello everyone again. Uh, let's start talking about components. So when we talk about wireless, we need to take into consideration uh, the purpose of wireless, that is sending a, most likely an audio signal from point A to point B. So there is a transmitter, there is a receiver, and there is the air, but in between, that is the medium we use. And uh, we need to be aware of it. We started uh, back in the 50s, uh, with uh, with wireless systems, uh, with the uh, Vagabond 88, that was the first attempt in this new technology. And uh, since then, obviously, we developed different technologies, different ways, different form factors. So now, if you look at Shure portfolio, uh, we have handouts, we have body packs, we have uh, gooseneck, we have uh, wireless boundary mics. So we increase the offer, but as a very basic, and we also have transceiver. So devices that can transmit and receive at the same time. But the very basic idea is to have a transmitter that sends a signal through the air and a receiver that can catch this signal and transform it again into audio. Great, Andrea. So if you could explain uh, what all frequency ranges are compatible with a wireless microphone system and uh, how does a particular spectrum affect the wireless system? Would shed more, more light on that. So, I like that we start the conversation with the medium in between that is probably the most unknown and a little, probably a little more complicated thing to deal with. Uh, the spectrum is divided in uh, several bands. Uh, we can, uh, we can see at the bottom end of a VHF band, that means very high frequencies, frequencies in order of 100 megahertz uh, that are mostly in use for uh, commercial radio, in example, and uh, they have longer wavelengths, and I don't see them much into fixed installation. Uh, for, uh, for fixed installation, and in general for professional, what we recommend is the use of UHF, that stands for ultra high frequencies, and it's between 470 and arguably 694 megahertz, but this is region dependent. We have some other small portion of spectrum that are in use, but um, uh, not much in our region, uh, like 900 megahertz and 1.2, 1.5. There are small portion of spectrum used basically in Europe, uh, but they will not be considered by us a lot. And then we have the DECT band that is uh, around 1.8, 1.9 megahertz, a uh, giga, uh, sorry, 1.8, 1.9 gigahertz. And uh, we have a Wi-Fi spectrum, 2.4 gigahertz, that is as well 
exploited for wireless microphone. So what we use mostly is UHF, DACT, and the lower portion of Wi-Fi around 2.4. Great, great, Andrea. Yeah, we understood. Um, now let's let's keep this for an uh, this session for a kind of application specific. So I'm going to take an example of a corporate office. Uh, I would say like a, a building uh, where we need the microphone solution. You know what? Let's take an example of uh, Tour HQ, our Niles building. As we are pretty much aware that different applications need uh, different uh, solutions systems and we don't always recommend to have the most expensive and the advanced solution for small setup and all. So talking about the corporate offices, we see different applications. For example, a portable mobile rack or maybe auditorium or performance venues and uh, corporate offices are having boardroom and meeting rooms, lecture theaters. So we will talk about these applications and what kind of solution we can offer for these uh, different types of applications. To start with, let's talk about portable rack. What do you recommend, Andrea, and which system and why? Can you please explain it a little? So for portable racks uh, in at Shore Headquarter, uh, we mean uh, small systems that can uh, have a very easy and quick setup. Usually they are, uh, they are used for a speech uh, when there is a birthday or maybe a retirement party or uh, this kind of uh, casual applications. And uh, for this type of application, we recommend uh, GLXD that is operating on a 2.4 gigahertz uh, band. There are few things to consider. Uh, here in, uh, in our region, a license for use of UHF is not, uh, is not a big deal, but uh, it may be in other countries. So. Uh, Wi-Fi can be used without any authorization at any point, and uh, it doesn't require any coordination or any any scan. It's fully automatic. It's very fast and easy to use, and this is why this is considered the best uh, solution for portable racks when we just need a, a very fast installation, very easy mobility uh, without too many concerns and without too much planning in advance. Yes, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, since you mentioned GLXD and uh, GLXD operates on the 2.4 uh, gigahertz frequency, do you think that it can get interference from other Wi-Fi devices and, uh, you know, that is in the close vicinity? And do you think that uh, GLXD is a reliable solution? And you can also discuss any uh, limitations that it may have. So this is a great question, but how... Uh allows me to, to open a big, big uh, Pandora's box. Uh, the performance of every wireless system is related to the noise floor of a place where you are operating. And uh, we all know that, especially in corporation, uh, corporate offices, uh, we may have a lot of Wi-Fi channels on air. Uh, we may have a lot of uh, Wi-Fi routers themselves. So this is something we need uh, to treat carefully. Uh, on one side, I want to reassure you that with GLXD, you don't have this problem of interference because it's automatically finding the free space to operate. But as it's operating in a very noisy environment, the operational range of GLXD and generally of 2.4 gigahertz uh, systems is not as big, as wide as other systems. So if we need a small operational range, then GLXD is our choice. Another limitation is related to the number of channels. If we need two, four channels, GLXD can be our choice. More than that, we should start considering carefully the environment we want to operate in, antenna placement, distance between the system and the routers. So it's very much application dependent. Uh, it's reliable, it's absolutely reliable, as long as it's operated under the limitation that it has as uh, any other 2.4 gigahertz system. So short operational range and uh, low channel count. Otherwise, we need to look uh, probably into something else. Got it. Pretty much clear, Andrea. 
TLXD, small channel count, short operating range, uh, something like mobile rack works pretty well. Uh, got it. Now, now let's take uh, an example of a uh, second requirement, which is going to be maybe for auditorium or uh, the performance venue. Yeah, and in these kind of uh, places and application, we see different type of performances. For example, having the musical instrument uh, and placing over there, or maybe going to have singer pre performing in front of everybody. So. Do you recommend having GLXD for that solution, that kind of application? And uh, what do you say? What do you recommend? So GLXD could eventually be used in this kind of application, but if we want a little more flexibility, especially in terms of channel count, uh, I would uh, I would look into our uh, UHF systems. We have a wide variety of UHF systems and uh, different price point, different performances, different technologies, uh, but it's absolutely uh, the, the type of technology that lets us uh, use more channels, so having uh, more than uh, four, eight channels on air without any headache, uh, a wider coverage area, and uh, it's perfect for performances because whatever is the system, analog or digital, you always have almost zero latency, so it works very well, not only for speech, but also for musical application. Right. Can I, can I ask you to elaborate more on the advantages of having uh, UHF frequency? Like uh, you had mentioned channels, so how many channels are possible with a UHF system? So this is a very tricky question because uh, the definitely UHF in general are capable of more channels than a 2.4 gigahertz system. Uh, but how many channels depends very much on the type of device and the technology you select. So we call it spectral efficiency. How efficient in terms of spectral use of the spectrum use is my system depends by a series of factors. One of them uh, is the tuning range, another one might be the, the type of technology, the modulation scheme, now, without going too much technical, I just want to give you a few examples. Uh, with uh, one band of BLX, you can accommodate easily four to six channels. Uh, now, these numbers may not completely match um, what you see on, on the papers about the, the system, because I'm not considering the maximum. I'm considering an average number of channels without any without any deep uh, knowledge, like in a simple way, you can accommodate four to six channels of BLX anywhere. Uh, with the uh, digital systems like QLXD and ULXD, uh, we have uh, definitely a much higher efficiency. Uh, we say that we can have easily 20 channels per TV channel, that is uh, one TV channel is eight megahertz. One frequency band of uh, ULXD and QLXD can easily have up to 80 or 100 channels. Plus, they present other modes like high density mode, and this number can really go high, high, high. Uh, when we select our system, it's not only about spectral efficiency, but there are other factors that we may need to consider and are more related uh, to the product. Uh, one of them is the capability of connecting on a Dante network or having digital output or for very critical application, even in the corporate world, uh, we may want an extra layer of safety, and then we may look into Axiom Digital that has very advanced features uh, to preserve literally in every possible condition of the stability of your signal. So there are many factors affecting the choice of the product you want to install and uh, or specify in a specific in a, in one building in one in one installation uh, but definitely spectral efficiency is the first one you want to look into so how many channels do you need and how much spectrum is available there for you got it got it great um you were mentioning about digital and you slightly explained about it and uh, uh, i always hear that this system is analog that is digital and people are moving towards digital system 
So can you please a little bit explain more on the, the difference between digital and analog system and having the advantage of a digital system? So, uh, of course, digital systems present many, uh, many differences with analog in terms of technology used. Uh, to try to avoid uh, deep technicalities, what we see is that they have a different system of sending information. The analog system is sending audio, somehow modulating a frequency, but it's sending audio, while a digital system is sending zero and one bits. Uh, this made the engineer choose different components, and the overall result is that the type of use of a spectrum is different. If I have many different channels, many very many different digital transmitters, uh, I use their frequencies and not much more. But if I have a, the same setup with analog transmitters, what I see in the spectrum is that I have a lot of other frequencies that are occupied by spurious frequencies. We call them intermodulation products, and they happen to be produced by the close proximity of multiple transmitters. Uh, this makes the analog system less efficient than the digital system. Of course, there are other things that uh, we may consider as benefits of digital, and uh, one is uh, especially important uh, when we talk about fixed installation offices and corporations, and it's encryption. While it's extremely difficult and expensive to have encryption on an analog signal, it's much more easy and efficient to have it on a digital signal. So I'd say that from this point of view, we, we have a better spectral efficiency, we have a little easier frequency coordination, and uh, we have the availability of the encryption uh, that help us protect our informations. Sure, Andrew. Uh, Andrea, do you think that uh, a site survey is in, important for such venues and installations? And uh, you know, what all should be factored in uh, during a site survey? And uh, also, do you recommend any any tools or uh, softwares to 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 the site survey? So, as we said in the beginning we are sending our signals through the air. Therefore, we need to know the air we are using as good as we can. Uh, site survey is exactly doing this. Uh, let us know what we are using to send our signal. And so you already know, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, part of our process. What we should consider is uh, several things. First of all, is the overall amount of channels that we, that we need so to understand how much space we need and what kind of, uh, of system we are using, if this is already specified somehow. So if it's a DAC 1.8 system, we may need different information. But if we are talking about UHF, the first thing we want to know using a site survey, uh, and uh, is, is, uh, we want to get a scan of the environment to identify other sources of RF that are around. Uh, the most common can be TV channels, not really a thing here in UAE where we live, uh, but uh, in uh, analog and digital TV channels are widely on air in most of the countries in the world. So this is the first thing. The second thing is other RF users in the region and other potential source of disturbance and interferences. To do so, we have different tools. The choice of a tool uh, depends very much on the complexity of the installation. If I need to install four simple BLXR uh, channels, probably what I need is already in the box. I can, uh, I can use the automatic scan uh, uh, inside my BLXR and identify four good compatible frequencies, and that's about it. If installation gets a little more complicated, then probably I want the capability to have a scan, visualize it using a software. Um, Tour is offering a free software uh, that is called Wireless Workbench that does the job very well. In this case, what you need is a network tour receiver that will cover a certain band that is uh, equal to the tuning uh, bandwidth, or a full band scanner. Full band scanner can be 
as entry level as the RF Explorer, that is a personal tool with some limitation, but allows us to have a view of a spectrum. And not looking, not seeing very well is much, much better than being blind, if you will allow me the metaphor. So the RF Explorer is me without magnifying glasses, but I can look into the spectrum and find out the major sources of problems. The more complicated and big the installation is, the more complicated and big and most likely expensive can be the tool I use to scan the environment. Uh, if you look at the Olympic Games, that is probably one of the most challenging RF environment, they use the Roden Schwartz and Aritzu analyzer, lab grade equipment. This is not what I would recommend for a system integrator that install some wireless systems. Uh, the tool that I think is, uh, can be the best compromise for a system integrator or for who's installing wireless in different environments is probably the Spectrum Manager. The Spectrum Manager has a lot of features, but between them it is a wideband scanner uh, that can operate with the same antenna system you use for your, uh, for your microphones. Uh, it comes at a very reasonable price. It's absolutely compatible and controllable by our software that is Wireless Workbench. And, uh, and you can use it really on a daily basis. Uh, dimension as well help a lot because it's one rack unit. So there are different tools you can use uh, from very basic to very complicated. And at the center of uh, this uh, picture, I would put the, the Spectrum Manager that has most of a benefit of superior laboratory equipment with most of a benefit of more entry-level solutions. Right, Andrea. Right, Andrea. So, uh, in effect, uh, it can do frequency coordination, uh, right? So, so what, what exactly is frequency coordination and how important it is for a wireless system to have frequency coordination in place? Good explain. Frequency coordination uh, means that uh, we do not select random frequencies, but we find out working frequencies and compatible frequencies. Uh, there are, I'd say there are three steps to cover to have an efficient frequency coordination. First one is uh, the site survey or the scanning or any way gather information about the environment we work in. The second important and absolutely critical step is to know the local regulations. Uh, we may think, oh, but these are wireless microphones, they will work everywhere. No, local regulations are in place and they may be slightly different by country by country. Uh, if we are talking about United Arab Emirates, we have certain regulations that do not match the regulations we may find in Europe or the regulations we may find in certain uh, countries of Africa or wherever we are looking at. So regulations is very important. And I want to go off track for a second just to mention that in some countries, we need a license to operate wireless microphones. Now, this may not be a very popular topic, but I really want to highlight this point, and it has an importance. We may need license to operate a wireless microphone based on frequency, if we, are, if we are operating in a country like UK or US, then to use a certain frequency, we need a specific license. Uh, in UAE, we have, I talk about UAE because it's our own country, and, uh, but we can, uh, we can eventually look in different countries as well. Uh, you need just a simple year license that uh, will cover your system for one year at TRA. This will allow us to protect our spectrum a little bit as well. So regulations is not just about being compliant to the law, but considering also the price of licenses, it's really something I encourage, I encourage everyone to look into, to be, to be on the safe side. And the third step is the calculation of compatible frequencies. Now, there are several ways to calculate compatible frequencies. One, if you have a single system, and probably the easiest one is to use a compatible group that every manufacturer will propose you in your in uh, directly in the box. So if you if you have a four ULXD, you go to group one. Group one means it's a group of compatible frequencies. 
you check that the channel you select are open and you are good to go. But as soon as you have multiple systems, different frequency bands, and uh, different solutions, then the coordination has to happen using a software. There are several software. Uh, I recommend Wireless Workbench not only because it's from Shure, but because it has two critical uh, features. One is free of cost, so you do not need to buy a license for Wireless Workbench, you just download it. And the second reason is that you cannot just coordinate tour products, but you can coordinate third-party products as well. And this is pretty unique as a feature. So you have a free tool that you can use to coordinate your microphones and eventually other microphones that are already in the venue, in the place, uh, no matter the brand, and you can even build your own specific profile if the need be. Now, I don't want to go too much on wireless workbench because it can be training itself, but I just want to highlight as the last thing that to have a basic use of wireless workbench, you don't need a training. You can be operational after literally 10 minutes. It's very easy to use, and uh, I really, I really want to want to stress on this. Downloading it and, uh, and getting familiar, it's a matter of seconds, so it's highly recommended. Thanks, Andre. Yeah, got it. Um, wireless workbench app means I'm from systems. I hardly uh, deal with wireless a lot, but still I can say like wireless workbench is pretty simple software. I have used it a couple of times and I was very comfortable. Uh, it's always better to use this kind of software and we are offering it free, so why not? Yeah, so system integrators, uh, you guys can also take the advantage of this software for sure. Uh, now, Andrea, let's move to uh, the next uh, topic, uh, the next component of the wireless system, which is antenna. As we know that the antenna plays a very important role in wireless system. So uh, I always hear half wave antenna, quarter wave, full wave antennas, uh, active antennas, passive antennas. So can you please elaborate more on the antenna side, like what all these terms are and how does it, uh, it, uh, it uh, what is technically is this? So, yes, of course. Antennas are a, can be a very critical component as much as they can be a very simple thing to use. Uh, the important thing is to be able to categorize the antennas correctly and then select the right antenna for your purpose. First of all, the antennas, uh, you mentioned the dimensions of the antennas. Uh, they are usually proportional, the dimension of the antenna is proportional to a wavelength that is somehow tuned at. So half wave means that the overall length of the antenna is half of a wavelength of interest. So in case, most of the time in professional installations, we talk about half wavelength antenna, but for this application, we do not use uh, full wave antennas because they are uh, they are creating problems with efficiency and um, and uh, impedance mismatch. So without getting too technical, usually the dimension is related to the wavelength. If we are talking about a VHF antenna, we would need a very big one because VHF are have a wavelength in the order of one 1.5 meter. So even the half wavelength half wavelength antenna is 80 centimeters. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we don't exploit much VHF in uh, indoor installations. UHF is having a wavelength of about uh, 50, 60 centimeters. Half wavelength is 25, 30 centimeters. So this is something we can actually easily use in any installation. Other than that, there are a few parameters that we want to take into consideration. The half-wavelength antenna is a dipole, and it's operating by itself, while the quarter-wavelength antenna, it's only half-dipole. It means that it relies on the ground plane that is usually the chassis of a receiver uh, to operate correctly. Therefore, we cannot remote quarter-wavelength antenna, but quarter-wavelength antenna have to stay next to the receiver. Other than that, Go back to categorization. Uh, what are the other parameters that we need to consider? One of them is definitely the directivity of the antenna. 
So antennas can be can have different pickup patterns. Uh, we can relate them to microphones, so we may have uh, cardioid antennas or super cardioid antennas or shotgun antennas, but this is not how they are really called. Um, they are called LPDA, log periodic directional antenna, or they can be called helical antenna. We we have a few examples at shore, like the HA889, that have also that present some advantages in terms of polarization. The most common, by the way, are the omnidirectional antennas. And here, they are not at all like microphones. While an omnidirectional microphone is picking up equally all over the pickup pattern, this is not happening when uh, you are dealing with an antenna. The antenna uh, is a whip, but it's polarized, and the top and the bottom are less sensitive points, while the center of the antenna itself is more sensitive, uh, has an higher sensitivity. So they, in the 3D graphic, the omnidirectional pickup pattern looks more like a donut than a real omnidirectional pattern. Uh, last topic you introduced is active or passive antennas. Now, whenever I design, I try to stick to passive antennas as much as possible, or if I use an active antenna because the polar pattern or for any other reason I, I like it, I need it, I try to reduce as much as possible the use of the amplifier. An active antenna is a passive antenna with a signal amplifier. What, why the amplifier is there, it's mostly, if not only, to compensate for cable loss. So active antennas can boost the signal to compensate for cable loss. And, uh, and you know that cabling is another very critical topic, so we'll, uh, we'll I think there, there will be some questions about cabling too. Sure, yeah. Sure. And also, uh, I wanted to discuss a very basic uh, or a common question that we come across, like, you know, I'm having one antenna and, uh, sorry, I am having one particular microphone. Why do I need two antennas to be connected to the receivers? Now, I know a little bit about the diversity uh, factor, but can you explain that in more detail? And why can't just one particular antenna uh, do the job? So the, there are few reasons to the, for the manufacturers to use a diversity system. That means two antennas. And there are different diversity systems. So the diversity circuit is uh, what happens to the signal, to the two signals once they enter the box. Again, without going too much into technical details, uh, the reason, the main reason why we need two antennas is to prevent multipath interference. As per the sound, if you have two signals, completely opposite polarity, the result is silence. The same thing is happening for radio frequencies. It's not unlikely to have one signal, the direct signal reaching the antenna, in very tiny fraction of seconds before a reflected signal that is out of phase. This would create cancellation. To manage this cancellation, most of the manufacturers introduced diversity. Then there are different ways to handle these two signals. Some of them are more efficient, some of them are more simple and easy to use. But the basic rule is that you need two antennas to prevent multipath interference that will result in dropout in certain random points in your uh, in your room in your uh, in your space in a very unpredictable way so two antennas diversity is to prevent multipath interference and it's not just a net on it's not to extend the coverage or you know to have a better it's just to have a more solid connection in the space that you are working in got it great um uh, talking about antennas, uh, let's let's take an example. What we have usually seen on site, uh, whenever we go and just inspect the site uh, and the installation. So I have seen many installation and uh, in corporate offices where installers usually keep uh, one antenna at one corner, second antenna on other corner of the room, and sometimes the distance is uh, more or less like seven meter, eight meters, I uh, ten meter as well. So. When, when, and I ask usually this question, like, why are you doing that way? Like, 
uh, why do you have one antenna on one side and another and another corner of the room and the common answer what i get is to match the aesthetic like uh, having two antenna together not going to look good and having two antenna on two corner it aesthetically looks better so do you recommend doing this is okay or is it right or it's a completely uh, wrong insulation uh, so we we need to be realistic uh, i think whenever we deal uh, with someone who's caring about aesthetic it can be a broadcast director as much as an architect or interior designer we may need to compromise the important thing i think it's to know what we can compromise with or when we can uh, you know be accommodating and when we cannot so having the if it's a if it's a big space and the two antennas are spaced apart 20 meters that's definitely a no the answer is from an RF point of view is like, no, this is not working, this is not helpful, this is compromising the functionality of a system. Uh, the ideal distance is related to the wavelength. In UHF, we are talking about 50, 60 centimeters. So if we are in that range, we are good. Now, if 50 centimeters is not enough and we want to extend our, uh, our opening of about one meter, one and a half meter, that's fine. There is no point fighting with the architect. But over a certain amount that I would, as a, just to give a number, I would say between two and three meters, that's the maximum we can, uh, we can allow ourselves. That said, to match the aesthetics, we also have other opportunity. One of them is to select an antenna that is not bad looking. Uh, sure is offering, uh, especially for indoor, the UA864 that looks pretty much as a Wi-Fi router uh, with a paintable cover so it can match even the colors. And I think this is a very good solution, not because, uh, not only because it looks good, but, but because it looks familiar. So interior designers are nowadays very, very much used uh, to, to deal with the Wi-Fi routers. And if it won't look weird to have a, one or two more of these, uh, let's say in a ceiling for a boardroom, so it will look aesthetically okay, and we can keep our diversity distance under control without being forced to place the antennas too far away. So the other last topic about antenna placement uh, at this stage that I want to highlight is that we, we said in the beginning that our antennas, the omnidirectional antennas mostly, but not only, are polarized. So we should try to have them, to avoid to have them parallel. If our antennas are polarized, we should try to give them a little angle that will increase the operational range of the stability of the wireless systems. Good. And I uh, wanted to ask you, like, uh, do you find it a problem when you have a wireless system installed at a close proximity with other screens or other RF sources? Uh, this is another point uh, that can be extremely critical or, or not. This is depending very much of what you mean close proximity. I, um, I see an installation where the antennas were placed behind the TV screen. That's what I close, close proximity, and this is a major issue. First of all, because we do not have line of sight uh, between the two antennas, and the second reason is that the TV screen, LED, LCD, and almost every electronic device, especially if it has a TPU or a, it's a DSP or whatever, it can create interferences to the system. So close proximity means very close to it. Otherwise, if we are talking about 50 centimeter, one meter apart, then it's not close proximity anymore, and we, can, we should be able to manage uh, with most of the devices. And luckily, uh, most of the electronic devices do not disclose in their user manual uh, what's the RF emission, what's the level, what's the frequency. So we should be aware that this can create problem and try to anticipate the problem uh, doing uh, proof of concept or just uh, before for a fixed installation, before installing the antenna, 
check that the system is not receiving too much signal, too much uh, spurious frequencies from the electronical device, and if it happens, then we need to act accordingly. Absolutely. Now, uh, I've seen in a couple of installations where, you know, the, the wireless receivers and antennas are placed inside a rack, and uh, you can see that the rack doors are also closed. So do you think that this is the right installation methodology for a wireless system? So first of all, let me say that I'm sure you saw it more than a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, this is a common practice, and uh, I would say this is a very bad one. First of all, because we need to give line of sight, while racks, especially if they are metal racks, are reducing a lot the capability of a system. So enclosed, um, enclosed racks can host our receivers, but then we need to use remote antennas and take the antennas out of the box to have a better line of sight with our receive with our transmitters and an overall better performances of our system. So uh, closed racks are not the best uh, the best place uh, where to use uh, where to keep our antennas. We need to take them out and um, use two cables go inside the rack and then reach the next uh, the next ring of a chain. But uh, no, we, do, we should not keep them inside because this is uh, really creating uh, potentially a lot of problems. Got it. Uh, talking about installation, I have also seen a couple of installation where there are more than two receivers and all are having their own dedicated antennas. It looks like antenna jungle in the rack, by the way. And do you think it is the right way to do the installation like this for the wireless system? Is it okay to have such installation? Uh, any more input on this, Andrea? So this is uh, this is another very common bad practice, and I'm sure again it's a little more than a couple of installation. Definitely, it's a little more for me. I see it happening many times. Uh, antenna jungles, as I call them, are not good for many different uh, reasons. First of all, the different antennas, especially if they are in close proximity and parallel to each other, they will shadow each other. And again, we have a lot of reduction in, uh, in terms of capabilities of a system. Another point is that multiple antennas means that the, also the receivers are close to each other. Uh, the receivers are close to each other, and if they are connected to the antenna, the result is that the intermodulation we saw happening for the transmitters happens also inside the receivers because all this uh, proximity between the antennas and uh, obviously it depends also by the shielding of the devices, but generally uh, rule of thumb that always works is like no matters how many receiving channels you have, what you should use is always two antennas. First of all, it looks much better and we know that aesthetics play an important role, uh, but it works also much better. Uh, two antennas, and then what you need is an antenna distribution system. Antenna distribution system comes again in different models, different um, capabilities, different features, but even the, the most entry level one you can find allows you to have a big jump in performances. So if you, if you are installing a small system, uh, let's say it's only two QLXD, you just need a very tiny couple of uh, passive splitters, and you are good to go. You have your two antennas connected to passive splitters, then they go to the receiver. If installation requires more than two channels, then passive splitter are not an option, and you need an active distribution system. Why so? Because every split means that 50% of the energy doesn't reach your receiver, but it's splitted. So we think that one passive splitting is enough. If you need to connect four receivers, three, four receivers or more, then you need to look into an active uh, distribution system. Just to, to summarize the, the, the topic of the antennas, I'd like to uh, use this uh, small checklist that uh, I hope people can see as I do. Uh, place your antennas as high as possible above the audience, above any, any other obstruction, any other obstacle uh, that may prevent your signal to go through the air. 
keep the transmitters and the receiving antennas as close as practical, uh, but uh, without exceeding in this practice. So I'd say that the minimum distance between a transmitter and a receiver should be around three meters. Less than that, uh, you may run into other issues. Place your antennas away from other and other sources of RF interference and whatever it can disturb you. And other than that, use the directivity not only to point at the source of the RF that you want to capture, but also to avoid unwanted signal to enter your RF, your RF system, increasing the noise floor and creating additional problems. Got it. Andrea. Now, uh, Andrea, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the cables. So what kind of cabling uh, methodology would you uh, recommend for a UHF-based wireless system? And what is the role of the cable uh, exactly in that system? And does choosing one cable from another, you know, affect the overall performance of the system? So it's a... Uh... This is a good question, but a strange one. We are talking wireless and we talk about the importance of cables, but of course, uh, jokes aside, yes, we need to take care of our cables because they carry our signal. Uh, what we need to bear in mind is that all UHF professional and semi-professional wireless system are using 50 ohm coaxial cable. Uh, this, this is a coaxial cable and uh, 50 ohm connectors. This is something that, especially on installation, we can never compromise on. 75 ohm cables are very good for our purposes, but are not good for our, uh, for our wireless systems. Despite the connector technically works and it can even um, pass the signal, there is a lot of loss and uh, standing waves happening inside the cable because of impedance mismatch. So, 75 ohm are a no, no go. 50 ohm cables come in, the, in many different types. The naming is usually mm, coming from Belden, that was uh, back in the days uh, uh, the first manufacturer of this type of cables. But there are nowadays many manufacturers offering cables. They just use the Belden name, but it's usually RG, a number, and one or more letters. RG58 is what we recommend for short path. So if I need to cover 50 centimeter, one meter, or I'm uh, doing the cabling inside a rack, RG58 is small, flexible, cheap. It doesn't require uh, any specific attention. So this is uh, the choice that we want. But as long as we know that the longer the, the distance, the more loss will happen over the cable. If we need to cover uh, 5, 10, 15 meters, we want a cable with better performances. Uh, for that, sure, recommends uh, RG8 or X or RG8, RG8U. Uh, if you have bigger needs, like your cable needs to run 30 or plus meters, uh, then you need to look into cables that have a diameter that is more important because they have a better dielectric, like the RG213. These cables are a little more expensive, have better performances, uh, and as a limitation, they don't bend so easily. So you can do sharp angles as you may need inside a rack, and uh, they are for longer, uh, longer journey. We said in the beginning that an amplifier can compensate for cable loss, and this is true, but an amplifier, as every electronical device, will introduce a certain amount of distortion. So, I always recommend to be careful and not to exceed the length of 40, 60 meters. Over that length, then you need, uh, you need to look into more complicated system involving fiber optics. Uh, they can be extremely tricky and, uh, and hard to set up because they have technical limitations. So, we, but we can say that short range, one, three, five meters, simple RG58 cable is good. Medium distances to long distances, so up to 30, 40, 50 meters, you need a very good cable. Other than that, you need to consider systems over fiber. Got it, got it. Great. Um, the, talking about the installation, Andrea, uh, 
I have also seen the rack generally as a distance from the room. Do you recommend long distance of RF cable to be pulled? I'm just give, asking two uh, scenarios and what do you recommend? That's what I want to know. So do you recommend long length of RF cables to be pulled from such a long distance or you recommend keeping the receivers locally in the room and take the audio cable to the rack room, which is far? Uh, how do you proceed for that in that kind of requirement? I think uh, you already understand what my answer will be with what I said before. I do not recommend uh, long distance cables and uh, they are not, uh, they are, they don't have many pros and they have a lot of concerns. Uh, we should, uh, we should consider that the cost of, uh, of uh, high quality RF cables can be up to uh, six, eight, nine, ten dollars per meter. So, the cost if you if you are pulling a hundred meter cable is very much relevant. On another side, uh, you may think, okay, but I need to have some control. I cannot remote my my receivers. But this is not true anymore because nowadays, uh, using if we are talking about sure using wireless workbench, you simply need an Ethernet cable and uh, you can visualize exactly what you see at the receiver and eventually have a certain amount of control on your receiver or in the best option that is uh, Axiom Digital on the transmitter as well, but we keep uh, remote control of transmitters on the side for the time being. But uh, I always recommend to keep the RF cable as short as possible. Only if it's not possible, you should look into different options. Last but not least, um, most of our, some of our products that I think specifically of ULXD, they offer an additional feature that is audio over uh, IP. So you simply pull an Ethernet cable or two Ethernet cables for redundancy, and you have your control and your audio traveling of much on much cheaper and much uh, easier to manage um, Ethernet CAT5, CAT6 cables, and uh, without any problem, you have your control, you have everything you need, and you just don't waste your money and your time setting a complicated antenna system with 60 meters of RF cable. So my recommendation is to find a little space in your room, in your installation for the wireless system and keep it as close as possible to the transmitter. But this is a, a cost saving and also headache saving. Got that. Great. So uh, my next question is directed to uh, to Ritin, since this is more on the systems portfolio. Ritin, uh, do you think that the wireless microphone can complement applications like boardrooms, uh, you know, meeting rooms, uh, huddle rooms, etc.? Definitely, Anish. Um, wireless microphone can complement, as said at the very beginning, that uh, meeting room, boardroom, conference room nowadays are having the modular seating arrangement. So having the wireless helps to uh, avoid unnecessary cabling and all, and it, it complements those kind of rooms. Now, when we talk about boardroom and meeting rooms, uh, uh, it's pretty much clear that these rooms are very special and CEO and the director or the key people of the company are gonna use specifically boardroom and also meeting rooms. So we don't want to offer a solution which just uh, uh, basically uh, is gonna create complication. So we want to give a simple solution for those kind of rooms where technology just work by itself, right? So they just need to use the wireless microphone. They just undock it. The technology will work by itself. It will communicate with the receiver and then start working. And those kind of solution is mostly, uh, I would suggest to go for uh, tech-based system, Microflex Wireless, what we can offer. Microflex Wireless is having those kind of flexibility. Uh, so I recommend to use the wireless in terms of Microflex wireless system for boardroom and meeting. Sure. Uh, now, a uh, question to Andrea. Uh, Andrea, we have heard a lot about deck-based wireless microphone solutions. How, how efficient is this particular technology? If you could just elaborate on that. Uh, no, good question. So, Thank you for asking, and uh, I'm uh, I'm really a big fan of the DAC technology. Despite it being uh, relatively old, it was standardized back in the in the 80s, so almost 40 years ago. Uh, but it's a it's a great technology, 
that has a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, of pros and only one small concern that definitely is not affecting the use in the boardroom. Uh, let's look at the pros. First of all, it's completely automatic. You don't have to do any frequency coordination. It's taking care of itself in a brilliant way. Um, it doesn't require much of a human intervention except for insanely high channels count where you really need to, to manage the spectrum with a little more attention. But if you need 24, 48 systems, it just works in a very simple way. And this is great. Uh, the, the other benefit of it is that it's also taking care of interferences. So if something happens in between, uh, you don't have any problem and the audio can keep going flawlessly because the system is capable of frequency swap. Again, by uh, so it's spectral efficient, it's automatic, it's almost perfect. Now the question would be why we don't use it for live performances? Because the only limitation of that system is that you have a little delay, a little latency that doesn't really allow uh, you to sing on a DAC microphone or at least you don't do it comfortably, but as long as it's used for remote presentations or whenever the sound, there is not a sound system involved, that is definitely a technology that works great. It's absolutely transparent and, uh, and prevents you from many, 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 many troubles. Uh, the, the antennas are following the same rules that uh, UHF antennas, but they have another pro that I didn't mention before, and that they can be transceiver as well, meaning that they don't only send information one way, but they can send and receive information in the same device. This is why they are sometimes in use in broadcast, or they can be used to feed the headphones for translation as well. So DAC technology is, uh, is really, I think, uh, one of the best weapons in your portfolio, and uh, because it's super simple, super efficient, and uh, and has great, great performances without most of the troubles that UHF can uh, can have. On top of that, it's free of license almost worldwide, so you don't even have to consider much um, the the frequency band you're using. It's just a DAX band. It's related to 1.8, 1.9. The only difference is between um, Europe, Middle East, and Africa that are using certain channels versus Americas that are using different channels. But other than that, it's a, it's really a great technology that can, I think, play a major role into, into boardroom and uh, this type of installation where you are using it mostly for video and audio conferences. That is the best option you have, I think. Nice to know. Uh, the next question is for Ritin. Uh, Ritin, uh, is there any other additional features that is available in the DEX system that you would like to add? Sure, um, uh, Anish. It's having a lot of features and functionality which we can talk about. Uh, DEX system specifically, our Microflex wireless system. Uh, as you can see, I'm just going to share the slide. It was shared already. It's having three most important component. The first one is access point transceiver. So that's the antenna and the receiver as well. So that is the benefit of having this system. Now consider you are having a UHF based uh, wireless microphone system and you need eight channels. So for that you have to have four rack unit to have at least eight channels and antenna distributor and then you need to run cables and all to, to place the antenna in the room. But with the Microflex wireless system, a deck based system, one single CAT 5E cable, that's it. You just use one single CAT 5E cable, which will be connected to the network switch. And the access point transceiver, what is showing in this slide in white color, is, is going to offer you up to eight channels. And the system can afford up to 64 channels in one system. So imagine you are just getting eight channels of microphone with one single access point transceiver with one cable. It offers different form factors like handheld, body pack, boundary, and gooseneck, which you can utilize. Other benefit, what I can say is uh, in meeting room and boardroom, mostly the requirement is for a speech. And when you do the conference call, you, you don't hear yourself. You are basically sending the audio to the far end. So even if the system is having higher latency, 
uh, compared to UHF system, uh, still it doesn't affect much. Yeah. And talking about DECT, other things, what I can say, specifically Microflex wireless system offers you TCP IP control. So for the system integrator and installed application, it's easy to integrate with third party control system like Crystron, AMX, Xtron. It offers encryption, it offers rechargeability, it offers network charging station. So you can monitor what is happening with the transmitter batteries and all. Uh, uh, when you charge it for the one time, it gives you almost eight hours of battery backup and it takes almost four hours to charge it. That's it. So talking about TCP IP control, encryption, rechargeability are the additional features what you can get with Microflex wireless, which is based on DEX system. And I would also like to add here that uh, not only DEX system offer this, UHF as well is having TCP IP control, encryption and rechargeability. Uh, so there are a lot of features what, what is shared, but with the help of DEC, you're just talking about one single cat 5e cable in the room and you are done with eight channels of microphone. So that is the benefit which is going to complement the system. Yeah. Very good. So uh, uh, Andrea, one last question about uh, uh, DECT. Do you recommend uh, the DECT based solution for a live performance kind of scenario? Uh, what's your view on that? I would really love to have uh, DECT-based uh, solutions in, uh, in live performances in auditorium because uh, they, as I said, uh, I like them and uh, they take out a lot of problems from uh, from the from installation. But unluckily, this is not possible uh, due to latency. So, as it was the last question, I want to make clear that probably we there are many other topics to cover. Uh, I just wanted to. We, we tried to, to give an overview of the uh, capabilities of a system as much as the problems of a system. And uh, uh, I th really think that once you have uh, an application in mind, there are definitely products out there for you. And it's very important to know the pros and the cons to make the right choice, because that's, this is the best tool that you, that you, this is the tool that you will end up using for a long time. So, a good solution doesn't have to be the most expensive or the most fancy. It has to be the appropriate solution for your need. And this is especially true when you're having wireless. If I buy a laptop that is just too expensive for me, I have a super powerful laptop, but I can still do my office uh, work on it, even if it's a laptop for engineers. But with wireless, if I need to use wireless in a certain environment for a certain application, then I need to be a little more specific in the in the product selection in the solution selection. This is the message that I, I really want to convey to to our listener because it's not that the best one works better. The best one can create more complication than than help you. You really need to look into the appropriate solution for your application. I agree with that. Noted. Great. Thanks, Andrea. It was a pleasure talking with you on these topics. I hope these uh, questions and uh, this discussion tech talk will help our uh, attendees to, to uh, solve most of the issues what we usually see on site. So now let's move to our uh, next uh, topic. That's it's not a topic. Let's go for the questions. So let's see what all questions we have received and I will invite my colleague Joyce to look on all those questions and we are here to answer those. So Joyce, all yours. Thank you, Ritten. Thank you so much, guys. That was a great session today. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Before we jump into the Q&A, quick reminder for next week's session. So on June 17, same time on Wednesday, we will have integrated systems portfolio. This session will give you a deeper insight of what solution Sure offers in the installed market. So uh, stay tuned. I will be sharing the registration link along with the recording of this session and an email that will be sh uh, uh, sent to you uh, shortly after uh, today's session. Uh, we also uh, would like to inform you that we will be having more uh, of those kind of uh, webinars and sessions where we will have special guests joining us and discussing different topics. If you also would like to uh, propose any topics from your side, in the email that you received from our end, there is a survey. Please take the time to fill the survey uh, for us and drop, on, drop uh, all the different topics that you would like to discuss with the team. 
In addition to this, we have the SAI online portal platform, which, you, which gives you access to the variety of courses and certifications online. So I will be sharing the link of the Talent LMS on the event chat box, which you can then copy and paste into uh, um, your folders and save it. Now, on to the Q&A. First question coming in. Do you have wireless surface, wireless with surface mount? Who would like to answer the question from the team? Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, let me understand this question a little bit more in, uh, in terms of installation side. When you say surface mount, like what, what kind of surface mount wireless microphone. We have Boundary, we have Guznik. Those are basically kept on table. So uh, are you talking about that or you're talking about the flushed surface mount? Uh, the question is slightly not, uh, if it is flushed, then it's not wireless, right? So I would say if it, you're talking about surface mount, surface mount means uh, the microphone which you can put on table. So yeah, we do have uh, Boundary microphone, we do have Guznik microphone. Those are wireless and yeah. That covers your question, I believe. Okay, next questions. Most venues have existing Wi-Fi using the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth, Some, uh, sometimes multiple. What are the odds those in-house Wi-Fi systems will interfere with such wireless mic systems? Can I take it? Yes, please, go please ahead. Andrea. So if we are talking about uh, UHF, uh, they, the, the, wireless, the Wi-Fi systems uh, in house do not disturb. But if we are talking about GLXD, so on a 2.4 gigahertz system, then yes, for our hearts, but the system is disturbed by it. Doesn't mean that we have interferences, but definitely uh, we will have a shorter operational range due to the higher noise floor. So uh, it depends on the system you use. Dacton is not affected, UHF is not affected, but clearly 2.4 gigahertz, as it's sharing the spectrum with Wi-Fi, will be affected mostly in the number of channels that are available and in the operational range. Okay. What is the standard distance of the wireless receivers? Is, is line of sight important? Andrea, I think you answer that's better. <laughs> uh, so there is no standard distance for wireless receivers. I assume the distances between transmitter and receivers. Uh, there is no standard distance. Any number be that is more than three meters, and, uh, and as long as uh, it is inside the operational range on the capability of a system in place, and the capability depends on uh, can depend by the antenna solution, the cabling, uh, the distribution system, and many other factors. Uh, that's fine. So there is not such a standard distance. Uh, and line of sight is always important. So if there is line of sight, our operational range will be much bigger than if we have not. Uh, so, but any number between three and uh, 30 meters, I would say, if we are talking UHF, will work. Uh, with line of sight, probably the, the minimum number of 30 meters can, can be increased. And for very well uh, designed systems, we, we, we saw coverages uh, that can reach uh, really like high numbers, like outdoor. Uh, I remember when we did the testing in our uh, office in Europe, in Eppingen, we have been covering about seven, 800 meters. So, but that's very much depending on spectrum condition noise floor, and, uh, and the system you're using. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, for everyone asking for the presentations, please note that we, will, we are sharing all the recordings on our YouTube channel, SureMia, and also by email after each session, so you may review the recordings there. Um, moving on to the next question. I have a ULX P4 R4 band. I cannot use it anymore due to interference with mobile phone company. Any things I can do to solve this issue? During rehearsals or when the hall is empty, wireless working good. However, when audiences enter the hall with their mobile phones on them, 
there's a problem. So this question is uh, is very easy, and uh, unluckily there is nothing you can do to solve a problem. Uh, not only because you may have problems with wireless, but because you are operating on a range where you are not allowed to operate anymore. In uh, if we are talking about uh, UAE and the old Middle East, therefore. Uh, there is simply nothing that can be done at this point. Uh, ULXP, for who doesn't remember it, was a product uh, made by Shure. Uh, I think it was discontinued around 10, if not 15 years ago. Not surprised that it's still working, but unluckily the spectrum and the regulation changed and that band is not allowed anymore. So not much we can do and we are uh, guests what, what it means, but we, when we use the spectrum, we are secondary users and we can use our devices as long as we do not interfere with the primary users. In this case, you are uh, working on a frequency owned by a primary users and you are not allowed to do it. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Another question. What are the cons of using ULXD in high density mode other than minimizing the coverage area? Uh, so, uh, I will answer to this, Andrea, and maybe you can add value in it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Abdul, yeah, of course, uh, ULXD high density mode reduces the coverage area, but it adds more channel count. So, standard ULXD offers you up to 64 to 67 channels. But with the help of high density mode, you can have up to or more than 500 channels in the same given frequency spectrum. The reason is, of course, the the power of the receiver reduce and it gives you the the the, the possibility of using the same frequency over the distance. Means when you reach go beyond that range coverage of the standard one, you can utilize that, and it is helpful for a kind of. A, application where you need more channel counts, more than 67, I would say. And uh, specifically university where you're having classroom next to each other and you have to offer. So these all are be the benefit of having ULXD in high density mode. And the cons is like you can have more channel count than the standard wireless uh, system what the ULXD can offer. Anything else, Andrea, you wanna add? My only one thing uh, maybe we can add is that uh, the, the high density mode allows you to have an insane amount of channels on air, uh, reducing a little bit the spectrum, uh, the, the coverage area. Uh, and that's the only concern you have, by the way. The, the audio is absolutely the same. Uh, so quality is there as much as in normal mode. The consideration I want to do is that you may need or you may desire to use high density mode when you have even a reasonable amount of channel, but still, when we talk reasonable, we say always more than 60, 80 channels in a place where the spectrum is already very busy and crowded. This is the other reason why you may want to use uh, HD mode. That said, honestly speaking, in Middle East, where we have a relatively forgiving spectrum, I, I see it in use uh, quite rarely and uh, really for very, very high channel count. Thanks, Andrea. Moving on to the next question. What is the allocated frequency spectrum for wireless microphones in UAE? So this is definitely my question. Yes, I will say because of that. <laughs> Telecommunication regulation authorities allow uh, microphone, uh, wireless microphone between in UHF between 470 and 694 megahertz only. Other than that, you need to look into DAC solution and uh, Wi-Fi, so 2.4 gigahertz solution. But for UHF. 470-694, and license year is on a yearly basis per device and is extremely cheap. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I've been told that it can make a difference if we use rechargeable batteries as opposed to disposable ones in a wireless transmitter. Can this really be true? 
let me take this uh, question, Andrea. Yeah, of course, uh, it makes a difference, and it is true. Uh, I will give you a very simple example. Suppose you are having a, a big venue, and you are having 100 microphones to be used every day, like a university application. And if you utilize a standard AA battery, and the room is always going to be used, every day is going to be used, so you are consuming two battery every day, multiply by 365 days. Imagine how much battery you have utilized, and which is just the waste after the use. Right, and you also need to think about the carbon footprint. You are just this um, is damaging the environment. Having the rechargeable battery is going to save your cost when you think about long term, like one year, just single battery. What you can recharge and use it every now and then is going to solve your unnecessary cost. Uh, it's going to help to uh, reduce your unnecessary cost, which is on the daily basis, and it will help to improve the environment. Carbon footprint is going to be uh, reduced. So consider the overall things, it helps. Yeah. And when you can calculate a one year of package using the standard battery and using the rechargeable battery, you will you will pay less than what you have already wasted. So of course rechargeable battery is the right way to go and it helps to uh, uh, yeah it helps to um, uh, give you the better uh, solution in terms of wireless. Can I add one small thing? Uh, for UHF products, so if we are talking QLXD, ULXD, and Accent Digital that can host the sure rechargeable batteries, uh, they have a chip inside that helps you uh, understand exactly how many hours and minutes of battery life you are still having. That is a much more precise indication than what you have uh, uh, generally, that is like three bars, four bars, five bars, no bars. It's a, it's much more reliable and uh, it gives you more information as well. I agree. I agree with you. Yes. Thank you, guys. Um, next question: Is it possible to use same deck system in both US and UAE due to radio frequency regulations? Um, okay. As we said. Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Go ahead, Andrea. go ahead, yeah. Okay, as we said before, uh, DACT is, uh, is related to the region. So USA and, uh, and Canada are allocating 10 megahertz only between uh, 1,920 and 1,130 megahertz, while in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, we have between 1.9 gigahertz and 1,920 megahertz. So we have doubled the space in a slightly different range. Therefore, the systems are not cross-compatible. So if you buy a transmitter, a transceiver in America, and you import in UAE, this will not work. Right. So basically, the, the, the SKU which is designed for US will work in US and the SKU which is designed for EMEA, including UAE, will work for uh, uh, that, that system on. Only just to let you know, so to give you more information on this, uh, EMEA SKU, as said, it's having the 20 megahertz of frequency range. So it offers you double the channel count of uh, compared to US. So 64 channels are possible uh, with the SKU, what we have for EMEA, and 32 channels are possible with the US SKU, yeah? Um, so if you are having the requirement for more than 64 channels, then you think in that direction. Otherwise, you are safe with the number of channel counts what you have. Thank you, guys. Um, so uh, this is the last chance to submit your questions. We still have one small scenario uh, to discuss, and after this, we will end the session. So here it is, and I believe that this is for Andrea. My personal experience, I had to place the GLX receivers on stage and very close to the band and singer. For some reasons, the range distance got very limited, and it just won't work from the front of house as intended. Any comments, Andrea? Uh, yes, and I'm not surprised by it because GLXD being at 2.4 gigahertz, as we said a couple of times during the, the discussion today, has a limitation in coverage area. Uh, on top of that, from front of our, between the front of ours and the stage, we have the audience. 
the audience is made of human beings that are themselves made with a lot of water. Water inside our body will absorb a lot of RF energy. So more than ever, front of house to stage is not a good placement for GLXD. GLXD has a smaller coverage area than UHF product and has to be very close to the, the, the transmitters and receivers have to be very close. So nothing unexpected there. Uh, the application of, for, you, for GLXD is exactly when transmitters and receivers are close. And when I say close, I say that the safe coverage area is between 10 and 15 meters, especially if there is Wi-Fi routers around. Great. Thanks, Andrea, Ritten, and Anish. We don't have any more questions coming in. Thank you all for joining us in our sessions, weekly sessions, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you for your participations and submitting questions as well. We look forward to hear from you and to see you next week in next week's session. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank guys. You for Thank you. you. Have a lovely day, everyone. Oh, there's one more question coming in. Can we answer that? What about... Uh, 1,785 megahertz to 1,805 megahertz band. Is this available to be used in UAE? Uh, the answer is yes, it is available. Uh, it's, um, it's next to the DECT band, but it's not uh, limited uh, to DECT technology. Uh, such a high frequency range it's somewhere in between the functionality of 2.4 gigahertz and um, and UHF, but uh, in terms of limitation, it's much closer to 2.4 gigahertz. So yes, it is in use. Tour in Middle East does not import any product in that range, because having so we, as much as uh, we have a lot of UHF available in um, in UAE, we think that we had no need. For uh, for that band for our products, but yes, it is a correct uh, right observation. This is available in uh, in UAE. Thank you, Andrea. I guess this is officially a goodbye for now, since there is no more questions. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.